Hi, and welcome to this special episode of the Faith Matters Podcast. This is Aubrey Chavez. Harvard Business School professor Clayton M. Christensen died on January 23, 2020, and he left a remarkable legacy. He was a monumental figure in both the business and academic worlds, as well as in the Latter-day Saint community. He was the father of five children and the author of at least 11 books. But to those who knew him, Clay wasn't just a thought leader or a world-renowned professor or an influential church member. He was a mentor, confidant, and friend unlike any other. In this episode, we speak with Ifosa Ojomo, Kyle Welch, and Barbara Morgan Gardner. I'll introduce Kyle and Barbara in a little bit, but we'll start here with Ifosa. Fos happens to be a close friend of ours who first met Clay during his time as an MBA student at Harvard. Along with Karen Dillon, Fos was the co-author of Clay's final published book, The Prosperity Paradox. I signed up for Clay's second year course uh, when I was a, a student at Harvard Business School. And he, um, he's got the most popular second year course. It's taught by five or six other professors. And I got really lucky that I ended up in Clay's section. Yeah. As you can imagine, his section is, the, you know, it's the one everybody wants to end up in. So I got really lucky. And I don't even think I appreciated how lucky I was at the time. I just... <laughs> thought, oh, wow, I ended up with Clay. Okay, cool. I didn't get um, it. Okay, there <laughs> yeah. you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, but I didn't know how that simple thing was going to change, literally change the trajectory of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, so I get into the section and we're learning. And as we're learning about different innovation theories and how they impact business, um, the, the name of the course is called Building and Sustaining a Successful Enterprise. Um, and, you know, Clay is teaching us all these um, business innovation theories and, and, and telling us, look, when you come up to a decision, don't just say, oh, I feel like I should invest in this company or I feel like I should buy this or like, ask yourself, are there theories out there I can use to make a much better decision, decision that's a bit more divorced from how I feel about it, my opinion. And so he always told us, you know, guys, I don't want your opinion in this course. I want you to tell me what the theory thinks. Um, so it's just a very unique, beautiful way of thinking and, and training my brain. But as I was listening in the class, I kept thinking, man, how relevant is this for um, Africa, for emerging markets, for places that really need growth through business, right? Um, and I think for me, that was sort of the first, like, man, this is really special. Like, Clay and his ideas are are really, really special. Um, So that was my first sort of interaction with Clay as a phenom, not necessarily Clay as a person. Um, And then I, 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 um, I went up to him after class one day, and I said, look, I think this is, this is important for the, you know, I guess what you would call the developing world, places that don't really um, have prosperity. And I saw him just light up. Um, and he he does something where um, when he's excited about something, he does like a fist pump, like sort of like like that, right? And he just, I just saw, I saw that and he got excited. And through the course of the semester, I realized, man, there was an opportunity to work with him. Um, yeah. And to sort of cut the long story short, I applied for that job. And, um, and, and I was lucky to get it. Um, but I, I also got to tell you the story of how I even found out I got it and the interview process. Uh, yeah. well. but, um, but that was sort of my first in- introduction to Clay. Well, I want to hear that. Will you tell the story about being interviewed in sort of an oh, interview? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it was sort of because, um, yeah. So, so, so that year, um, and you guys can relate to this. You remember um, HBS, um, you know, second semester, second year, you know, if you hadn't found a job yet, you were sort of a little stressed. Um, <laughs> so was your wife. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? That's why you, you could, you know, the whole family, because you're like, hmm, I know how much this experience cost me in terms of money and just, you know, getting my family from where they were to where they, like, and I don't have a job. Like, what am I going to tell people? Like, I went to Harvard Business School. Like, I'm the loser. Harvard Business School mm. will never be the loser. Anyway, <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm over there thinking like, okay, crap. Uh, folks, you need a job. Um, what, what I was working on fell through, and, um, and I was desperate. So I, I wanted this job with Clay, not just because I thought he was special, but because, like, I needed, I needed a job. 
Um, but then the more I learned in the class, I was like, crap, I really want this job. I don't even want any other job. Like I want to work with Clay. And then I found out about this research position. Um, I applied for it. I thought, you know, I got decent odds. There's two positions, there's two spots. And, um, you know, most people at that time have gotten jobs and how many people want to stick around and do research with some professor. So I thought my odds were great. Then I find out the year I applied, like 40 people applied. Wow. And I'm starting doing the math. Now you, can, you guys can do the math. <laughs> Two over 40 is not exciting. And then on top of that, I realized the guy who did the uh, research position the, the previous year in 20, who graduated in 2014, we graduated 2015, was, um, was going to stick around for another year. So now it's really <laughs> one spot, right? So one spot for 40 applications, I just started praying. <laughs> this is a miracle. You need to show up. Um, and then, so it was time for my interview. I made it to the interview round. And um, I put a binder together, a folder with all the theories. And I was there to explain to Clay, like, this is how we could do it in Africa and create growth and this. And I walk into his office and we greet each other. And the first thing that comes out of his mouth is, hey, Afosa, would you like to come write this book with me? And, <laughs> and I mean, you know, just imagine, like, I don't know if it's ever happened to you where you, 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 you like, imagine you get ready to, to like have an argument with somebody and to, <laughs> to like defend your case and, you know, yeah. and the person says, oh, wow, you know, Tim, Aubrey, like, I, I agree with you. And all of a sudden, you're like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened. I was like, huh, okay. Um, well, first of all, yeah, but what about all this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we just had a conversation. Um, we laughed. We talked about the theories, the relevance, um, talked about life. Um, and he just got to know me and he said, look, we'll, you know, we'll take care of you. And mm -hmm. that, I didn't even appreciate or understand what that did to me until recently when I, when I was thinking about it after he died. And I said, you know, Clay had a way of giving you confidence you didn't even know you had. Um, yeah. I was an engineer in college. I didn't write a lot. I didn't read a lot um, <laughs> and here he was this master this great icon of innovation asking me um to write a book with him and he didn't even know he didn't know if i could string a sentence together like that's that the message that sends right is amazing but i think that's not where clay stopped he knew if we were going to be successful, he would have to be patient with me, right? Because, I mean, the chances that I was a great writer were really slim, um, largely because there are not many great writers out there. So, and, you know, so they were really <laughs> slim. Um, and so he just knew, okay, for me to co-author a book with a false I'm going to have to be patient. But that was built into him. He just, oh. he was just so patient. And I didn't realize that again until... About um, around the time the book came out, about a year ago, I look at um, early drafts of the book, and I'm like, how did, how did I not get fired? <laughs> because <laughs> I'm telling you guys, they were so bad. Um, they were so bad, they were, I can't even say they were not good. They were bad. <laughs> and, and Clay would read those drafts, and he would say, man, you're a really good writer. Mm -hmm. Again, he was seeing something in me that I couldn't see. And he would give me counsel. He would give me feedback. Um, you know, one analogy I use when, when, the, when the book came out and people were asking, so like, how does it even work collaborating with Clay? How, like, how much do you write? How much does he write? And I said, you know, guys, I think you're asking the wrong question. Think of it like this. You have a GPS receiver in your car, right? And when you have a GPS receiver, you know, maybe in your phone or whatever, um, 
the GPS receiver in the car is, 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 it looks like it's doing all the work, right? That's what's giving you the turn by turn. That's what's telling you turn left, 200 feet, whatever. <laughs> but what happens when you don't have reception? What happens when there's no connection to the satellite? The GPS receiver is useless. Clay was my satellite. Mm. I was the GPS receiver. And all it took was for me to constantly engage with him. Um, and yeah, I wrote words, but the the words were built with the personality of Clay. The, the like his thinking, getting the thoughts in his mind and learning. And, and that, that, that also has now helped me uh, develop um, as a writer, as a thinker. Um, and so, I, you know, I've lost a mentor, a friend, a colleague, and, you know, my, my satellite, you know, yeah. He, yeah. He special. Yeah. I know um, one of Clay's hallmarks, at least, from my perspective is that he was a uh you know obviously he was a great thinker a great business person um but also a person of deep faith um and i know you're a person of deep faith folks um yeah. with a different you know outside of our of our particular lds tradition i'm curious because i have sort of that uh it, we because i have that shared tradition with clay i'm curious what it looks like mm. between you and him or or between him, if you, if you saw him interact in other ways with other people, yeah. how he shared that faith and what that what that looked like to you? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I, I don't even care what faith people are part of. Um, you can learn a lot from Clay and how he, he um, in a way, because uh, again, you know, yeah, I've been thinking about Clay a lot recently and Clay transcended religion. Mm. Now, I, I don't mean to be sacrilegious when I say that, but what I mean is, look, if the biggest thing you know about me is that I am a Christian, um, but the, and, and, and like I go to church and I, I pray before my meals and, and things like that, then I sort of miss the point. But if the biggest thing you know about me are attributes like love, patience, care, uh, compassion, faith, long suffering. I mean, how many times did he come in and was in pain and mm. worked through the day, right? If those are the things you know about me, then in a sense, when I talk about why I've been able to get to those things, you don't you don't care, you don't mind, you, you listen, you lean in and listen because it's, n it's no longer about my religion per se. It's about these other attributes. And that's a huge thing Clay taught me. Um, he just taught me that, look, if folks, I understand in today's world, using the word God and faith are like big taboos, but you have to ask yourself, um, what is truth? What matters? How are you living your life? And that's why I think he was able to so freely just talk to people. And he would say mm. things as a matter of fact. I mean, he would I, would, I would listen to him give a talk. And he, he would say, you know, God doesn't um, like create data. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't say mm. like, um, he wouldn't say, well, you know, I know some of you here might believe in God and some of you not, but, you know, just, no, he <laughs> yeah. would just say it as a matter of fact. <laughs> God doesn't create data. We create data. And um, data is only about the past. And he would explain something. But the way he would interweave his faith into what he did was seamless and beautiful. And it was never unnerving. It was never like, ooh, he, he just said that word again, the G word. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and I don't know how to do that. I want to learn how to do that. I want to learn how to do that. But, but, but as I've been reflecting on Clay, I think I realized maybe um, 
learning how to do that, right? You use like talk about faith in, in a way that is, uh, is just seamless. Natural, yeah. It's less about learning how to talk about it and it's more about living it out so yeah. that it just becomes a part of you because that yeah. was play, right? It was, he, wasn't, he wasn't talking about something that was removed from him. He was just talking about his life. He was told when he thinks about his life, you can't, there's no like Professor Clay, HBS Clay, uh, writer, author Clay. Okay, oh no, R religion, L LDS Clay, mm -hmm. he was just Clay. Yeah. Um, and that, that is so profound. I love that. It, it occurs to me as you're saying that, that's like, that's the definition of integrity, right? It's wholeness. It's, it's yes. a single, it's a single entity. It doesn't separate who he is into into different, yeah. into different um, yeah. spaces. That's yeah. amazing. Um, are, are there any stories that you that come to mind that you want to share before we wrap up? Like any interactions or stories he told you or? Um, yeah, well, what, one, um, I mean, there, there are so many. I think in, in my mind now I'm thinking about, um, well, I'll, I'll say one in particular that's, that's, that's very, um, yeah, very, very personal. But um, when when I started working for Clay, um, this is uh, you know, Ju Ju July of 2015, a few months after I graduated, I, um, um, I, went, I went through, I started going through a really rough patch personally in my life and um, um, uh, ended up, uh, you know, uh, my marriage ended up not, it ended up failing and um, and I, I remember um, how it just really affected me. I, I was really struggling uh, with it. Um, and whenever Clay would see me, he would um, ask me how I'm doing. Um, not how the book is doing, just ask me how, like, how am I doing as a person? And then this one day in particular, he, he sees me and I mean, he sees I'm struggling. He says, you know, Fosa, this, this thing that you're going through is really, really hard. Um, but I think my advice to you right now would be um, essentially twofold, right? One, lean into God, lean into your faith, pursue him like never before. Um, and, you know, the second was, let's write this book. Mm. Now, I think... Um, at the time, I didn't understand, like, why, you know, it wasn't like, go take time off, you know, because he said, you know, you could, you could, like, you know, wallow in your sadness, and, you know, this is a terrible thing that's happened, or you could, you could take all this energy mm -hmm. um, and apply it to something good, um, and wow. that's what I did. And I got to tell you, man, it was very helpful. Mm. Um, it was it was very hard, but it was very helpful. But I also think Clay, you know, Clay doesn't just say something and, and lets you go. He, like, coaches you and helps you mm. along the way. So every single time he saw me, he would ask how I was doing. Again, not how the book was doing, yeah. which meant he cared about me as a person. I think that's the thing with Clay. And, and I feel the same way about um, member, members of his family that I've interacted with. It's like they care about you as an individual, not necessarily your contribution. Um, that's a story I'll, I'll always remember because it, it was counterintuitive in a typical Clay fashion. Um, yeah. But it led to such great, like, goodness. Um, so... Wow, that's one, beautiful. One final question for you, Fos. What What's the big biggest difference between pre-Clay Fos and post-Clay Fos? Man, um, <laughs> pre-Clay Fos and post, well, I mean, there are the tangible differences that like Google my name and yeah. you know, I've, got, <laughs> I've got a TED Talk with over a million views. Yeah. I've got a book, I've got, you know, uh, there are those tangible differences. 
Um, but I, I would say the, the biggest is um, as a follower of Christ, you, you, have, you already have an example in Jesus. Like you have someone who lived perfectly. And I think um, sometimes we can relate to, uh, to that, Jesus' sufferings and so on. But other times it's, he's so distant. It's like, where, like, where is he? Like, I could see you. I could see my employer, my uh, uh, colleagues. Like, wh where is he? Um, but then, you know, on occasion you meet a person like Clay who embodies um, some of these attributes with not perfection, but I would say um, as close to perfection as you, as you can find here. And then that infuses a certain sense of hope in you that, um, that you know what, mm. if Clay could do it, I could do it. Um, and so for me, um, some of the things we've learned from Clay, uh, like you said, Tim, the integrity as a whole person, um, are things that I, sh I strive for so much more today than I did um, um, before Clay. Uh, one practical way that shows up is, you know, Clay talked about how he always wanted, wanted to be home for dinner, mm. didn't want to work on the weekends, things like that. And the idea of those things were very impossible to me, impossible. But then you meet Clay and he lived by those as best he could. Um, and look at all he accomplished. Yeah. And so similarly, I'm, I'm in the, in the same bucket. I'm like, okay, 5, 5.30, I'm done with work. Mm. Weekends, I'm not, you know, there's no work on the weekends. And it's just become n like part of the norm for me now. And I mean, the idea that I would do this three years ago, like, I'm like, nah, man, I got to work. I, just gotta, I go home, I work, with pre, yeah. And so that's one simple practical way it shows up, but I think that's tied to a much bigger um, quest for for perfection or yeah. with regards to you know integrity and, and love and loyalty and all these things. So. Next, we talked with Kyle Welch. Kyle is another great friend of ours and a professor in the business school at George Washington University. Kyle became close with Clay as well during his time at Harvard as a doctoral student from 2009 to 2014. So I um, was a doctoral student. I started at uh, Harvard Business School in 2009, and then I graduated in 2014. And uh, over that course of time, I spent you know about five years there, um, uh, uh, getting to know him, uh, taking his course, and then meeting with him, talking about um, different ideas and research and, and things like that. And I got to know him uh, when I was there as a student, and then also as a stake missionary because I was a stake missionary when I was there, and go to stake missionary meetings and things like that. And so uh, he is somebody that was great because he'd have these firesides and different ways to think about stuff. And uh, um, for me, for me, uh, he's yeah, like there's very there's a very short list of people that have ways that they changed my perspective in so many different ways. You talk about vocationally, you talk about how I see the world in business, and then also how, how my faith is, just had that impact on, on me. And he had that impact without even trying. Like, it's not like, I'm always trying to change, but like, I just tried to change both your minds. Like when I got on about what you should be doing with your stuff, right? But I, like, it was not like that. It was like, it was always like, hey, let's talk, like talk about ideas. And all of a sudden your mind would be open to like all these other things. And it was, uh, it was amazing. So, um, uh, uh, I guess, I, is this just me talking about it? Or do you yeah, guys yeah, well, yeah, I, go. I, I love so, that. I love what you're saying about that because to me, it seems like for some something about the way that he lived and the person that he was gave him this free pass almost that nobody else had to talk just like purely in the world of business and he could theorize and he could um, he could analyze and then he could jump into this totally other sort of faith-based. Oh my gosh, he had a way of actually, his way of bringing in the gospel to conversations that you would not expect it was was amazing and you know and did it in such a way that actually got people to think in in good ways right now as like a, as an academic you mentioned god you mentioned anything you're you're like a little nervous 
And it's funny because he kind of leveraged that almost a little bit, not in an edgy way, but like, I remember, you remember his, his, him talking about, you know, uh, you know, Zeus and, you know, Zeus version of God and, and yeah. a God that works within the, the, the realm of laws. Right. And, you know, obviously he's hinting towards, I mean, people don't know this, but you know, God is like a super scientist, like Einstein says, that's essentially the same thing. And, and it's, you know, in line with LDS, you know, theology too. And he used that as a framework to talk about managers thinking they're Zeus and they can just change anything versus, mm. you know, there's certain things that they have to deal with. And he just did that over and over again. And it was, mm. it was, it was neat to see it in the class. And I've, uh, uh, I've, I've totally ripped off some of his stuff and use it yeah. in my class all the time because I think it's great. I think it's great stuff. Like I, like bringing God in the way he does and talking about different things um, is wonderful. So yeah. yeah that's awesome. I, I've heard too, and I, I wish I had had more personal interaction with Clay, but there, the, the, the impression that I got based on, you know, talking to people that did know him a little bit better was that he had, despite, you know, the fact that in the last couple of decades, he had made quite a name for himself and was obviously a very, very busy person. That he seemed to have a, an innate ability to focus on those individuals, the people that he interacted with and give them so much direct attention and somehow convey the love that he that he felt for them was that was that your experience as well yeah yeah it, it you know it's funny you, you you interact with these uh mba students that come by every two years and all of them feel like oh man i like man we were like this yeah. right <laughs> and it's funny because i i felt that way too but i also knew he made everybody feel that way yeah. right and so like it's funny he uh he was just a, he had a way of making everyone feel that way and so um uh it's it, and not in a fake way, like not in a, like a car salesman way. He just, he just, when you sat down, he'd talk to you and he'd ask you ideas about stuff and he'd say, okay, let me think about things. And then yeah. he'd send you very personal things. And like, like, uh, like, fortunately I was there long enough that like occasionally like they'd say, Hey, we need to know something about students. Let's go to Kyle or something like this. And so like, uh, you know, I read one of his early editions of the, uh, you know, uh, everyday missionary book and uh, you know when it was a draft and and it was just I read it in I read it in under 24 hours I just couldn't put the thing down and it was just I mean it, I mean those that have read the book like kind of get a sense of of how he was with uh, with talking about faith and firesides and different things like that and it was and it's fantastic it's 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 like a new perspective on things like I remember one so he had one he had his innovation in faith did you ever hear his innovation in faith fireside thing that he oh, did? Well, it's a, so, yeah. so, so he had this thing where he had, well, one of his talks was, is that he'd, he'd talk about, you know, church innovations, right. And how they started. And he went through almost every single program that we have in the church. And for, for a long time, I tried to figure out a source for all his stuff. And I found it in the encyclopedia of Mormonism of all places in my mom's house. Right. Cause I'm like, I got to find out where he was sourcing all this stuff because he was talking about it. And he sounded like he really knew what he's talking about, but I got to find out what the sources were. <laughs> but so, so like, for example, the primary program, primary program was started in Utah because one of the moms, like uh, on one of the streets, like one of Brigham's wives or something like this, just decided like, you know what, we got all these kids or they're acting so crazy. We need to teach them about the gospel and some focus for them. And so they started the primary program when it came to yeah. like the perpetual education front, there was an individual actually doing this, that it ended up being such a successful thing. The church looked at it and percolated, percolated up. So it became a church wide program. Mm -hmm. And, and his point in saying this is something that in given that you have like a faith matters blog, his point in doing this is that a lot of times Mormons look at that book of, of rules and say, well, if it's not in the book, we shouldn't do it, right? You get a lot of this rigidity around the faith thinking that, you know, just because it hasn't been done, it must be wrong. Uh, and, and the reality is, is that it, it opens your mind to a whole new set of ideas about, uh, about approaching the gospel, reaching people in fellowship right like in a way that like you should be more creative about like i remember when i was on a mission like, i was always out i was always following the rules and doing everything like this and if anything that didn't seem like it was painful i didn't do it and then i remember serving in palo alto and we had these great missionaries there one of them was a semi-pro tennis player before he was on his mission and so they're in palo alto a place that like basically despises religion and he talked to his mission president he says do you know what i think i can probably share the gospel better playing tennis and it was like, and I heard it and I, you know, with a few years post mission, I heard it. And I was like, I mean, come really? And then yeah. I thought, well, you know, well, it's Palo Alto. If you're going to, if you're going to bet anywhere, bet here, right. You're not, it's not like South America where they're, you know, you're going to miss stuff. Right. And so 
he did that. He ended up, the, the, the missionary with his companion ended up baptizing two families in Palo Alto in like, in a matter of like four months. And it was because they took a creative approach to leveraging what, you know, talents they had to doing things and, and picking things up. And so like, I now look at things totally different from the church as far as like why things are the way they are. And anytime it's funny, cause you, you get people that complain about things in the gospel in the church and when you hear like how things originated and how things are, it goes back to the same old thing that you deal with of just like, you know, you're dealing with humans. And so, you know, yeah, you might have a stake president or a bishop that has a rigid idea of something, but you know, that's part of the process and you just deal yeah. with it yeah. and just figure a way around it. Because the reality is, is that the faith gives an opportunity for us to explore and do things totally different. And yeah. so his talk on that, unbelievable. And he just went down program after program after program. It was amazing. Wow. I love that. Now, I know that Clay liked to teach using, using stories. I mean, that was, that's the case in his innovation books, but also, also in faith. Were there, any, were there any stories that he told that have particularly stuck with you that, are, that have affected your faith or the way you think about the way you think about Yes, it? yes. And he did, and this is how he crosses things over. He does it in a secular way. So uh, uh, he does it in faith in a secular way in the sense that um, he talks about his meeting with Andy Grove. Um, and Andy Grove was the CEO of Intel. And um, uh, uh, he talked, Andy Grove basically said, oh, this guy's got a great, great thing about how businesses, you know, go out of business. Let's have him out. And he had him out. And he talks about this all the time. He says, and Andy said, okay, tell us what we need to do. Right. We're in chips. You know us. Tell us what we need to do. He says, well, let me tell you about the theory. He says, no, tell us what, tell us what we need to do. And so Andy Grove kept on wanting to get it. He says, no, let me tell you the framework and then let's talk about it. And he says, it's just take about 15, 20 minutes. And so then Andy sat, listened to it for 15 minutes. And then Andy said, I know what we need to do. Mm -hmm. And that's where the sell your own processor was born. Mm -hmm. And from that, he said that um, he used that for talking about faith in the sense that um, uh, he said that uh, God requires us to ask questions for our faith to grow. And the reason why is because if he just tells us we don't learn it. For some reason, our brains don't, they can't, he can't throw books at our brains, to, you know, from, from the sky and get us to pick it up. Really for us to learn things, we have to have questions and we have to wrestle with these questions and deal with these questions. And once we have these questions and we look and find the answer, that's when we actually get a solution. Andy wanted the answer. And had he come out of the gate and just given him the answer, he wouldn't have like, he wouldn't have, had, you know, wouldn't have been there. But, but when it comes to questions and asking questions, Clay had this great way of approaching things. He said, questions build faith. And so he, he mm. basically, um, he, he, his view was is that science, science and religion aren't two different things. Science and religion are the same thing. You're looking for truth. And anytime one is off, that means the, the you know, off, off center, that means you need to recalibrate your understanding of what's yeah. going on. Wow. And so it was, it, it, he had this way of, he had this way of talking about the spirit. He said, um, he'd say, look, you know, the spirit can be this, you know, divine thing that, you know, comes in and, you know, I don't know what, you know, to your body. Right. Or it could be, you know, you know, a tipping of serotonin level, levels in your mind that gives you a new insight to mm -hmm. something. And he wow. says, I don't care. Like, why do I care? What I want is that insight. I want that truth yeah. that I wouldn't have discovered otherwise, right? Because the spirit, I mean, the real advantage of having the Holy Ghost is that you would learn things that you wouldn't know otherwise, right? Yeah. But like if anything you could figure out on your own, like that the spirit's not really necessary, it seems for that. But when you need something that would be outside of your own knowledge, that's yeah. when the spirit becomes really valuable. And his, his response was, I don't care if it's serotonin Nothing. or you know something else, yeah. however it works, that doesn't, that has no bearing on the fact that it yeah. works. Some detractors of spiritual experiences might say, oh, well, that's just, that's just hormones. That's just something, that's just something going on in your brain. And he's saying, that's fine. Like that, why would, why would God not work that way? Right, right. Mm. What, and maybe that is, right? Maybe that is. And it's kind of one of those things with faith for me that has like, it, it ends up becoming an anchor when you think of things that way, because, um, you know, it's like in John six, uh, where, Christ, you know, the followers of Christ, get met with the question of like, he says, Hey, so are you going to not follow me too? Because I said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And I'm sure they looked at each other and like, this is weird, but you know, you're the only one that has the, the bread of life. Where else are we going to go? Our final interview is with Barbara Morgan Gardner. 
Barbara has been on our podcast before. She's a professor at Brigham Young University and the author of the book, The Priesthood Power of Women. She got to know Clay when she did her postdoctoral work at Harvard and as she served as an institute director in Boston. I, so I first met at Clayton Christensen. Um, I received a phone call from him and he found out that I was being assigned to be the Institute Director out in Boston. Mm -hmm. And he just called me and said, this is Clayton Christensen, you probably don't know me. And frankly, at the time, I didn't. <laughs> and he said, of course, I'd heard his name, but I didn't know much about him. He said, if I can be of any help or if I can support you at all in your decision to come out here, because I hadn't decided yet, he said, I would love to have the opportunity to, to talk to you. Wow. And so I said, I would really appreciate that opportunity. If you can help me making, in making a decision to come to Boston, I would really appreciate it. So he said, well, let's make a time available. And so he actually made an appointment with me. I met him in his office there at Harvard in the business school. And he probably talked to me for a good two hours. Yeah. Uh, welcomed me to the area, helped me understand the position of the church, the members of the church, the interfaith culture, uh, why he believed that it was important to have the right personality there. No pressure at all, just told me everything I, he felt that I needed to know with a lot of encouragement. Wow. So that's how I, I completely ran into him by him just reaching out to me and helping me understand better the the realities of what was going on in Boston. Wow. And then after, so you accepted, moved to Boston. I did. I did. And, okay. and frankly, much because of his involvement, he, I, I could tell that because he was so, um, he had so much to give mm -hmm. and he was so interested in the church and the members, but also in the whole entire community that I, I continued to just feel like this is something I needed to be putting myself into. Of course it wasn't completely him, but his outreach was, was an, a big impact, had a big impact on me. Yeah. So, so looking back on that year, what, what things come to mind, like stories or lessons or things that, that when you think about your interaction with him, um, how, what is, what's influenced you and, and what comes to mind? Honestly, it's amazing how much that man has impacted my life in, in the year I was there, but also in the continued contact he kept with me after I left. But in that year itself, I'll, I'll just give you, I'll just give you a few instances that just kind of, um, I think are significant. One was when I was out there trying to decide if I should come, he did say to me, if I can help with anything, please let me know. Well, people say that a lot, but the difference with Clayton is he would call me on about a monthly basis, or he'd see me at church. We were in the same ward and he would say every time, Barb, is there something I can help you with? Barb, is there something, do you need something? Do, do you want to come over to my house and discuss anything with you? Just always very available, very open. And I kept thinking to myself, this man could literally charge thousands and thousands of dollars for the time he's offering me and he's just willingly doing it. So one day I actually took him up on it and I said, you know what, Clayton, we actually, I'm actually trying to figure out some things to, to impact and have a positive influence on the Institute and seminary program here. And I would love to have a chance to talk to you, especially with, with, with the topic on the topic of those who are struggling with testimonies or really struggling the young adults with the church. And so he invited me over to his house and it was just he and I and his wife was, wife was just kind of walking around here and there, but he sat me down on a couch. And again, for another two to three, probably three hours, I recorded the entire conversation, which he said I could. And he literally asked me about individuals. He asked me what the situation was. He analyzed the entire scope of things and then just gave me as much feedback as he could and of course asked my opinion but i was just really there to wow. listen i took wow. notes on everything and he told me about experiences that he had had as a member missionary he had told me experiences that he had worked with young adults but he took it extremely seriously and yeah. then just kept asking me what i thought and one of the things that i thought was fascinating is he would he, he's a he's a definite thinker so he would ask me what would you think about the way i analyze this and does this sound accurate to you and then he would wow. kind of practice the idea on me and then just say, okay, now how do you think we could implement this in order to help in this area with members of the church? Or how do you think we could use this to help people that are not members of the church, but to understand our background or our interfaith standings and things of that nature. I and mean, he was, it was phenomenal. Yeah. Wow. And he acted and, and I've heard people say this, but this is 100% the case. There were two people in that room, he and I, and just the two of us and, and his wife would come in, but I was in his 
it's all I could tell is in that moment, I was the only person that he knew existed except for the people I was talking to or talking about, sorry. And it was, yeah. it was so amazing and yeah. so intelligent and so fresh, so wise. Yeah. Now, when you were when you were speaking with him, did you did you get the the business professor sense from him? Did was that sort of um, the did he use those? And because you're, if I understand it, your background is sort of in in education, and obviously he comes from a, a business background uh, academically. Did you feel that he was applying business frameworks as he spoke with you and worked with you in the church, or was it more? It was it more uh, general or more religiously oriented? He would he would take business frameworks at times, things that I didn't understand, and but he would say to me, "This is the framework, or this is a case study we might want to consider." And then he would take the case study and he would apply it to, he would apply it to a religious slash educational perspective. He knew that, he knew my background too. He knew that I had a PhD in instructional psychology. He also knew that I was, you know, trusted in the church, and he knew that that was the lingo that I was accustomed to. He was very adept of taking his lingo and making it uh, easy for someone of, frankly, my intellect, but also my background to understand. So yes, he was very ad- he was very adept. Clearly, as a as a professor of of business at Harvard, but I think that's one of the beauties is he could take those principles and apply them to any situation. Wow. I feel like we've heard we've heard really similar things from other people. Just just how 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 you would listen and process, and then he could he could apply these same theories across any context. Yeah, and they were. I mean, he would say, "This is the theory." And frankly, I don't remember the theories. He would say, "This is a theory," and he would say, yeah. "In business, we teach this." And he said, "Okay, now now let's let me see if I can help you help us." And he wouldn't say "you" as if he was demeaning. Let's see if we can yeah. make this applicable to our current situation. Yeah. Meaning. The situation I was dealing with, but all of a sudden that became his as well. Yeah. He, he, owned, he, owned, he owned what the discussion was as well. He owned the, he owned the, the need and helped, and helped fill it. And there was, again, no pressure. He was just simply saying, what would you think if, or yeah. this is a possible solution, or, or perhaps we can think of it in a completely different way. Maybe this isn't even a problem. Maybe this yeah. is a complete opportunity. And so I'll give you an example. One of the things that we, we were looking at just individuals that were struggling with um, membership in the church. Mm-hmm. And he would say, sometimes we look at the broader picture and we, we talk about a number of people at a time. And he said, why don't we just talk about one student? Let's talk about, and not by name, he would just say, let's talk about one individual who was attending Harvard, who may have this kind of background and see how we can help that one individual. Wow. And after we learn about about that individual, perhaps we can learn about another individual. And he would just, he would just say, okay, now let's try it. Let's try it from a different perspective. And then he would try a different business model. And we would just keep going through until he could kind of help me come up with something that actually could make a significant impact. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, in the, obviously he's very, he is very well known in the, in the broader world for his uh, work on, on innovation. But in the Latter Day Saint community, he might be most well known for his uh, for his book, "How Will You Measure Your Life?" And so I'm curious, what what were sort of the lasting impacts that he had on you in terms of how you think about those things, like how you how you measure your own life, or you know how you orient what you're working on, or you know what what is most important to you at the end of the day? Yeah, let me answer that in a couple of different ways. So I was also working on postdoctoral work at Harvard while I was back there. And our professor, one of our professors, she was a a woman who was in charge of helping people become Ivy League presidents, university presidents. And she had us read that book and a paper by, by Clayton Christensen and just said, frankly, he, you know, he's a, he is a very good, solid person. You may not necessarily agree with everything, but then she said, I highly recommend him and I highly recommend his principles because I have found them sound in my own life. And, and, and I was very impressed when she told us that. So, so back to how you measure your life as well. I, there was a time when I was asked uh, to speak at the Memorial Chapel at Harvard, which is a pretty big deal. It was over Easter. And I thought, you know, I need to go in there and just see what other people are speaking at Harvard and kind of get an idea of, of what they say. And, and I didn't even know who was speaking. I just walked in one day and it happened to be Clayton Christensen. Mm. And he gave the most incredible talk on the brother of Jared and spoke of um, 
brother of Jared and, and using his intellect and using his wisdom and being able to receive miracles from, from God. And I remember thinking in that moment, I cannot believe I am hearing any person at all, let alone Clayton Christensen, giving an entire discourse to a public audience at the Memorial Chapel at Harvard University on the brother of Jared. But what it did for me, besides the fact that it was an incredible discourse, what it did for me is it opened up the door for me to be able to teach my own faith and to teach correct principles regarding um, the gospel to this audience. So he wasn't trying to convert anyone. He wasn't trying to talk Mormonism or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was just trying to teach correct principles. And that happened to be the book that he was using to teach those principles. Wow. And it was powerful. So when I go back to how do you measure your life, one of the things that he talks about is that you're being honest with yourself, that you have goals and, and that you are doing things that are right. And, and when I, when I think about what he was doing in there, he wasn't, he didn't care what anybody thought. He wasn't trying to have somebody else measure his life. He wasn't trying to speak to the crowds. He wasn't trying to be applauded by anyone. It was, he had a, he had a firm foundation on who he was as an individual. He had specific goals that he was looking to accomplish in his life. And he was going to follow through honestly with what he set forth to do, which gave me, frankly, the power to be able to do that myself. I was I mean, a strong individual already, but to watch him do it opened up doors that I didn't even realize that I was perhaps closing without knowing I was doing it. Yeah. Wow. His, his book, that paper is, is extremely impactful. I've seen, I've seen students at Harvard and BYU and I've been on airplanes and just seen people read that over and over again. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I really appreciate his work on that. Yeah. There's just something about him that for some, it, it seems like I do this and I think a lot of people do this. We kind of segment our, our lives into different, into different areas and we yeah. speak, we sort of adopt different vocabularies as we speak to different groups of people. But something about him, it was just it, like his, his faith was so uh, just core to who he was. He didn't, he was always, he was always himself. You know, always. No matter, no matter what the audience, no matter who the audience was. Yeah, he he didn't, it wasn't like he was speaking to a religious group um, of those who were not of our faith and trying to tell a different story and then going to the business school and telling a different story and yeah. then going to church on Sunday and telling a different story. Yeah. He was the same person on Sunday. I mean, and I've, I literally have watched him and I've been in his office at home. I've been in his front room at home. I've been in his office at Harvard Business School. I've had him in my area. I, I've, I've watched him in different settings and he is the same person regardless. Now, that doesn't mean he can't speak. He, he's, he's wise enough to know that he doesn't necessarily have to change his vocabulary, but he can speak to the individual. He seeks to understand them so he can speak with them. Yeah. He doesn't speak over them, but, but at the same time, he's not, he's not in any way fake to, a, to one group of people. He's not hypocritical at all. He is Clayton Christensen, regardless of where you find him. It seems like, I feel like the, the, the thing that I, I keep hearing from everyone and from you is that he can do that because he's not coming from this place of pride where he has all the answers and so he trumps anybody in the room. It's like he, he has like this profound curiosity and humility that like is so disarming that it seems like he can take that into any context and people receive him lovingly because it's just, he's coming from, from such a, a humble place. And I just love that because we, you know, we all respect him so much, but everybody has told these stories about how he asks these questions and, and it's like, it, I think it really requires some vulnerability to just throw out these maybes that, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't really know the answer yet, but he's, he's willing to just throw something out and see what you think and weigh it together. And I just, I, I think that's so interesting and I just love it. And, and, and like you said, he's throwing things out, but I, I really do believe he is, he's he believes and has high expectations for everyone he's talking to yeah. so in the case where we're sitting together for three hours and that was one experience it wasn't just we, we had other experiences but but in that case remember so clearly that he actually did expect that i was going to come up with something with him wow. like somehow wow. together we were doing this it wasn't just me watching him but yeah. i mean i would just sit there and listen but he wanted he wanted my feedback he wanted my ideas he would ask you know what do you think about this and then he'd say okay, what kind of model do you think you could come up with? And I was like, really? <laughs> yeah. but, but then I tried because he, he gives you him, he empowers you. Like you just, yeah. you just keep going because he doesn't in any way, there's no demeaning. There's no looking down. He clearly, he, he genuinely wants to know 
what you think or wanted to know what you think. I think he probably still does want to know. What yeah. Is. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that um, humility, I'll give you another humility moment. I, I thought this was fascinating. One time I, I flew quite a bit between Boston and Utah and he did too. I was on many flights with him, but I remember my first flight with him. I think he was with his wife, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. He was he was seated in first class, um, which didn't make a big difference. Frankly, he was so tall. I hope he always had a chance <laughs> to be in first class. He was a tall, big man. Mm-hmm. I remember him coming back. I mean, we talked, we chatted on the at the airport beforehand. But I remember him coming back to my seat and saying to me, "Barb, it's late at night. You're by yourself. Would it be okay if my wife and I gave you a ride home?" And then I said, you know, of course he does. That's so thoughtful. I have things taken care of. He's like, I know you probably have things taken care of, but please just let me. And then thinking that, wow, he really, he really cares about me, which he did. But I saw him do that to five more people on our airplane. Like it wasn't just me. It was just, it's like he couldn't help himself, but to be nice and notice individuals and notice individual needs. I don't know what he offered to the other five people on the airplane, but I know he just sat and just walked back and talked to five different people on our flight and just, every single person was into the conversation and clearly every other person seemed like they were best friends with him. Wow. It, that's what I mean by the humility. He was, yeah. and it wasn't like he was trying to prove anything. He was just genuinely kind and genuinely wanted to help and really saw, seemed to think that we were all in the same, same plane. Yeah. But we were yeah. literally on the same plane, but I mean, on the same level. <laughs> <Right. laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Both oh, that's, are amazing. that's so great yeah. is there anything else before we wrap up that you want to add he touched every person every age every gender every cultural background everything it nothing mattered he just cared about individuals and he cared about helping them with their lives he was a phenomenal example for me i that's that's that scratches the surface of many of the things I learned from him. And again, like I said, he even kept contact with me after I left Boston and continued to reach out to make sure that everything I was doing was okay. And it could continue to ask, is there anything I could help with? Even when I was no longer even in his yeah. area. Yeah. Phenomenal. And I'm sure he had so many people who was, I don't, I don't know how he was able to reach so many individuals one at a time, but he did it. He was phenomenal. Wow. A life changer for me. If I could, if I had a little bit of Clayton Christensen in my life, I would consider myself, as he says, a very successful person. Thanks for spending some time with us today to remember and honor the life of a remarkable man, Clayton Christensen. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and are as inspired by his work and his life as we are. Thanks so much to our guests, Ifosa, Kyle, and Barbara for coming on and for helping us all to try to be a little bit more like Clay.